Ladies and gentlemen, Paula Brown. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so, artist or artisan, the role of a chef. That is the title of the demonstration today. Um, the reason why I chose that is I think there is a growing movement within food in this country, in Europe certainly, with a balance between not just being an artisan and creating good food, but being an artist as well. Self-explanatory, but I'm going to play a short video of us in the kitchen. And this gives you a sense of what we do. So Sally, wherever you are, please. This is my former restaurant, by the way. The, na the name was Guilt, so Guilt Free is the uh, name. Um, what, we, what we do in the kitchen is uh, a style of food which could be consumed as modern European, modern French. We like to call it um, dematerialization, is the concept behind the food. The idea for that is taking unfamiliar products and marrying them into something which is unrecognizable. However, there's a difference between that and deconstruction. Deconstruction taking the idea of taking familiar products and just rearranging the different textures, flavors. So what we do is, um, is an homage to molecular gastronomy, to uh, certain chefs from around the world, Pierre Gagnier, Ferran Adria, people like this. And we just put our little touch on it. Um, so here we have, we're just seasoning things here. Yeah. This is it. So, so what also we're going to do today is do two ideas of dishes. One being a foie gras, which you're going to see at the end here, and one being a liquid sablé, which Jordan, my pastry chef over here, is currently preparing. Um, the idea for this is to give you a sense of what we do rather than demonstrating an actual dish. So I'm going to nip brown here and we'll get ready on the foie gras. This is, this is Scott, by the way. He's my sous chef. Say hi, Scott. Hi. <laughs> and this is Jordan, everybody. Yeah. So get the foie gras on the side. We, are we still playing? Yeah, we are. Okay. So this is, uh, you're going to get a tied up shot of this when we finish the DVD, but if you can just see the, uh, the attention to detail with the food, you see the style of the food. This is, uh, this is not your traditional French classical cuisine. This is something which is much more fresh, it's modern. This is definitely something which we enjoy doing. Um, it can be construed as uh, avant-garde, I, I suppose, but we don't like to call it that. We, we have a, the molecular gastronomy is a big movement by which we, we base ourselves around. And the idea for that is not actually to recreate the wheel, it's not re to recreate something which has never been done, it's to just give our little touch on what we do. Um, refinement in cuisine. Um, so here we have the croquants, this is some of the dishes here, this is, uh, I, don't, I don't even know what that is. But. It was, it's tasty, I, whatever it is, I assure you. Um, so you see there's multiple elements to the dishes. Uh, there we go. No, 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 that's still me. No, no, okay. Multiple elements to the dishes, it's flavor, it's texture, but it's not a traditionally, uh, you have your product and you have your sauce and you, it, it doesn't have to look like that. We try to get away from being the, the, the straightforward style of French cuisine. So, uh, we have another kosh here. We have something else. And the DVD is just doing its own thing. The DVD, oh, shut up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, for those of you that don't work in a professional kitchen, this is a, this is a good little view of what it, what it takes to produce uh, 100 quality meals uh, a day. And here we have the foie gras, which is this right here, in service. So there we have it. OK? So OK. Now we're going to do two ideas that we're going to talk about. Um, and I say idea, like I said, because uh, 
we're not recreating a new technique. We're not recreating something which is not there. All we do is we add a refinement to it, and I give my little personal touch on it. This first dish that we're going to do is um, it's foie gras, okay? And put that towards the camera. And the idea for this is um, is foie gras and a traditional sauternes jelly, which very traditional style in a terrain you'd normally have it. And the idea for this was to take a foie gras and rather than have it in a traditional terrine mold, have it more in the natural shape of the foie gras. Now this is the whole lobe of foie gras and we cook it sous vide. Um, and we reform it and then we glaze it in a gelée made from hibiscus and beet juice. And it adds element to the dining experience. If you go to the table and you see this and we carve it in front of you, it adds character, it adds theme, it adds, it's exciting. It's not just a plate of food anymore. Obviously, we, we respect very much the traditional way of cooking the foie gras, the taste, that is paramount. But the form, the idea, that's what we try and put our spin on. Um, Scott is going to plate one up for you now um, so you can see what it actually looks like. And we actually have a DVD over here, which is going to be the technique of glazing the foie gras, of how we do it. Because it actually takes some practice to get the, uh, the nice glaze on this foie gras. So as Scott plates, I will put this over here for him. Are we there you go. There we go. Queuing the DVD. Yeah. OK. So we actually have two techniques here. Um, one is the actual glazing of the foie gras, and the other one is a uh, liquid gel. And the base on this is agar agar, which I'm sure most of you know is a seaweed-based gelatin, a hydrocolloid. Um, and we use this actually for both techniques here. The idea is that we, uh, we make a, a very viscous gel with the uh, agar agar. And it is to the point where it, it, it adheres to the foie gras very nicely and quickly because it's fat foie gras. So you can't generally glaze a piece of foie gras like this without it running off. So it takes a lot of practice to do. So as you see, we have the beet juice. This is hibiscus, which we infuse into it. And we cook the agar in the beet juice. And as Scott is doing right here, we also have a uh, liquid gel right here of tamarind. We infuse the hibiscus into the beet juice. We let this steep for about 20 minutes to really infuse the flavor. It's phenomenal, this flavor. And that adds a nice sour note to the foie gras. And there we have infusing. Um, this, this was not actually at my restaurant. I did this last week. Um, kind thanks to the folks at Butter for letting me use their kitchen. And then we have gelatine and we have agar here. And we cook this out. You have to cook agar for at least five minutes to be fully hydrated at uh, 212 degrees. And we skim off any impurities from the juice of the beet and the hibiscus and we strain it. Now this is the foie gras lobe. The way we actually cook this is we would take the foie gras, we open it up, we take the main veins out of the foie gras, we reform it, and then we sous vide, and we cook it whole, as a whole lobe of foie gras. We then chill it, and then as you can see, we glaze it, and it glazes very, very nicely like this. And this is a uh, finished product. And this is the other technique that we're looking at with this uh, gel, it's a fluid gel. This is using just straight water and lemon juice. Again, this is a, a very useful technique which you can be used in savory or sweet. We use this for multiple applications in the kitchen. This one that we're actually putting on the plate here is, um, this is a little, a little thicker, but this is using tamarind. So we have two, these two techniques on this plate over here. The idea being that you have water, and we take some sugar, and we take the agar, and we cook it, like I said again, five minutes, 212. We really cook out the agar to fully hydrate it. We add in your lemon juice right here, and then it sets. It sets into a hard block of jelly, which I'm straining it here. And this then is blended to make a fluid gel. 
and this is heat resistant and you can play with this on a hot plate. Agar melts at 85 degrees centigrade, so we can do it on a, uh, a hot dish, obviously below 85, and it has a very viscous, beautiful, silky texture, uh, which marries perfectly well with the foie gras being that it has a beautiful, fatty texture, obviously. I'm just cooling it down here. As you see, we blend it here. And, yep, there we go. And you get this very beautifully viscous gel. And what I'm doing here is knocking the air out of it. When you blend something, obviously you're whipping air into it. So I just quite simply take the air out. And as you see, the texture is quite beautiful. It's silky. So, it's very tasty as well. Okay, so Scott is, uh, is finishing the, uh, the foie gras over here. So again, the idea for, for cooking the style of food that we do, I mean, you have multiple elements here, obviously, but everything seems to be very cohesive. When we talk about texture, when we talk about flavor, we have here, for example, a piece of watermelon. And this watermelon has been sous vide. Do you wanna, do you wanna get a, a shot of this? You want to get a shot? Want to get a, 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 can you get a nice shot of that? Can you zoom in on that? This has been sous vide, this watermelon. Uh, watermelon foie gras, maybe not your most traditional combinations, but the idea being that we crush the cells in the watermelon. We create a beautiful, fresh tasting piece of fruit, which marries again very well with the hibiscus, with the foie gras. And we have a, uh, a dish here of the finished product, which you have multiple textures here. You have multiple ideas. These are the croquants of Malabar spinach, which we like to use as well. The watermelon, okay. The watermelon is not cooked. In a sense, you are cooking it by crushing it. We take raw watermelon, and you could do this with mostly any fruit, and you crush it in the vacuum of a sous vide machine. What this does is it splits all the cell walls and you release the, um, the water from the actual watermelon and you get this opaque looking piece of melon. You can also do it with apple, you can also do it with pear, you can also do it with pineapple, anything like this. And it's a really excellent technique, especially when you want to do something like a chilled dish, etc., without actually doing a straight piece of watermelon. It works nicely. It has a very beautiful flavor and texture. So now I'm going to move on to Jordan over here. Jordan is a very talented young man. He is a pastry chef, um, formerly of Alinea in Chicago. And Jordan and I have worked together in the past. And we did a dinner last night, which was a lot of fun, those of you that were there. And he's going to explain um, another, I say, idea rather than technique of something new, but an idea of a free-form sablé biscuit, which we actually did at the dinner last night as well. So, Jordan, please. Sure, thank you. Um, essentially, uh, we title this liquid sablé because it's a very provocative name on a menu. It sort of captures attention. It's like, oh, wow. Um, essentially, it's nothing uh, that I would consider really creative. It's just sort of taking an existing classical French technique and just sort of evolving it slightly. Um, the idea, the concept, uh, came from, uh, originally there's uh, a technique called a petit beurre. It's like a, basically a shortbread that you bake in the oven and then when it cools down you grind it in the uh, food processor with butter and then you pack it back into a mold and you cook it again and it holds that form. Uh, butter being a saturated fat, it's uh, solid at room temperature. Um, so it, you know, it's sort of like a, a very, very firm paste and you sort of pack it. Uh, I took the, I, that idea and I used a, an unsaturated fat like olive oil, which is uh, liquid at room temperature. And so essentially we cook off the sablé. There's almond flour and butter and sorts of things in it, a very classical sort of sablé method. Um, and then uh, essentially pureed it in the uh, food processor with olive oil and as you can see, the texture at room temperature is extremely liquid. Um, the reason why this is unique is it allows you to sort of make very, very uh, different shapes uh, of stuff. Um, and because we use fat to puree it, it does not um, get soggy. It maintains the nice uh, sandy uh, quality that a sablé has. So 
essentially, you can just sort of pour this out. And as you can see how runny it is. Um, and this is just acetate. You can use parchment, whatever. And we just press it. And you have to place this in the freezer or in the refrigerator, uh, obviously, for it to firm up. Um, because you can't necessarily serve it at, like this is uh, not really that palatable. So it's a, it's a cookie that has to be served frozen. So uh, when you get it and somebody says sable, it's, it's really, really cold. And it has a unique uh, texture to it. And uh, I wanted to sort of uh, show some different applications you can do with it. Um, thank you, Chef. As you can see, you can make these freeform shapes and you just uh, essentially peel the acetate back and you have 3D cookie um, that you could clearly not do this any other way. And I mean, when you, when you get this served, uh, let me grab the plate. Did you pull the plate out, Sean? Right here. Stole it. Um, okay. Clearly, it's, it's extremely provocative. Uh, and it maintains a very rigid form, as you can see, uh, maintaining that grit. And as this sits, it'll slowly start to relax and fall and settle. Um, and essentially, uh, once we spread it out like this, you put it in the freezer and it gets uh, very uh, firm like this. And you just sort of lightly warm it with your hands because it's very, very sensitive. And then you can just sort of mold it into any shape you'd like. Um, also, uh, another sort of variation on this uh, that you can do is uh, you can actually fill this, uh, fuse two pieces together, and put a filling in the middle, which I'll demonstrate. So we essentially have just blocks of sable. And you can place one down. And I'm using uh, tomato seeds here uh, to prove that this has a savory application as well take some of the sugar out. Um, you need to uh, supplement that uh, with uh, butter and salt as needed. And then you essentially just put another piece on top. And it's sort of a, a technique that's being used a lot in uh, modern food today. You just run this underneath salamander or with a heat gun. The top melts and uh, creates sort of a, a veil over it. Place it back in the, uh, in the freezer. And you can sort of trim it. And it makes a very, very, very nice um, sort of presentation, and you have something in the center. You can fill it with ganache. You can fill it with gel. Uh, Water-based substances are fine. Like, like I said, tomato season, it doesn't get soggy because there's the fat to sort of separate the two layers. Um, and that's essentially the, uh, the liquid sable. I was also asked to, uh, to talk about the Paco Jet and to sort of demonstrate it for those of you uh, who are not quite so familiar. Um, can, can I just say, does any, anybody not know what the Paco Jet is here? Have a show of hands, please. We have one person, two people. A couple. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, um, it's essential. Oh, go ahead, chef. Please. Did, did this really, for a modern day chef, this is like having a child. It changes your life. Yeah. Um, I can't say enough about this machine, about the folks at Paco Jet. Um, this is a phenomenal piece of equipment, which every major kitchen has these days. Essentially, this is something which you, you would make uh, ice creams, uh, creams, purees, whether it be frozen or savory. Um, sorry, sweet or savory. And this machine allows you to be more than just an ice cream machine. Jordan is going to explain now the technique of how it actually works. Um, it's from Switzerland, and it's fantastic. So please, Jordan. Thank you. Uh, as a, a sort of a really good um, commercial ice cream maker, uh, usually runs anywhere between eight and twelve thousand uh, dollars. Paco Jet is a lot more cost effective, and so a lot of restaurants use it. And it's very, very um, compact, and it's not that heavy, so it's sort of really, really versatile. Um, essentially, uh, a stand-up, uh, typical ice cream machine churn uh, has a compressor around uh, a bowl, and you essentially put your sorbet, your ice cream, or whatnot. And it whips air as it's cooling it. And so what happens is you create very, very fine mm -hmm. ice crystals, which in turn uh, give you a very much smoother sorbet and product. The pocket jet sort of works differently in that you actually freeze the mass solid. And then 
the machine has a blade and it has a separate valve that incorporates air. Um, and I'll sort of demonstrate. It's kind of loud, so I'll only do it for a yeah, second. John, don't, don't walk too close yeah, yeah. to the mic. Yeah. Mic, uh, okay. okay. Yeah. There you go. Uh, this essentially has a blade and there's a magnet here and just sort of fits yeah. in. And uh, another really great thing about the Paco Jet is just sort of a lot of chefs are using it for a la minute ice cream, which means, like, uh, as a lot of people know, ice cream always tastes the best right when it comes out, like that really, really nice silky texture. So Paco Jets allow you to spin ice cream. And it, I mean, for a full can, it takes about two to three minutes. Um, but it has adjustments here, uh, one through 10. So you can spin literally this much sorbet. So for an entire night's service, if you just keep you know, a pocket jet container of vanilla ice cream and somebody requests it, you just click it to two and you have one scoop and it goes back in. So you're not aerating the entire mixture and the more you aerate it and the more you put it in the machine, uh, the, the texture sort of uh, deteriorates over time. So, so from a business aspect, this is a, a lifesaver. You ever, anybody knows who's ever made, uh, I'll wait till it's finished. Thanks. Sorry, I had to turn it on. Okay. <laughs> Uh, just give me a second. Uh, essentially, there's an air valve here, and you press this blue button, and you can hear it, it releases the air. Now, uh, in my opinion, and a lot of pastry chefs' opinions, ice creams and sorbets are better when they're a bit denser, uh, and the pocket jet a lot of times can uh, incorporate too much air, and sometimes when the product comes out, it's like a frozen mousse rather than a really sort of dense, uh, it has that sort of chew quality ice cream. So what you can do actually is have uh, one of your assistants who's not busy and just hold this release button down and uh, that sort of takes care of that. Um, I'll stop it. And uh, you can sort of stop the machine as needed. I mean, it's, really, it's a really cool product. It doesn't produce any heat. So it's sort of very, uh, any application, you're working with something frozen, you're working with something warm and stuff. Uh, it's really, really great. And then you make sure to press the release valve, otherwise you have sorbet everywhere. And never. It makes a nice hissing sound when the uh, air comes out. It just yeah. slides out. This so is, uh, from a business point of view, this is a fantastic machine. You have no wastage. You can spin the exact amount of sorbet ice cream that you are going to need for that night's service. Regular ice cream machine, once you've spun your mix, you've spun it. You melt it down, you have to redo it, you lose flavor. This, you're only going to use what you need. So it's fantastic from that point of view. Sort of. Um, I don't yeah, the, the mix on this uh, sorbet is a, is a little different to how we would normally do it, but here we have. Actually, you have yep. a whipped frozen product, Alaminute. And yep. uh, it does look slightly grainy, but uh, it actually is pretty smooth. Uh, it's, it's stiff, uh, which is good for scooping and, and things like that. Um, I mean, this, this thing you can do, uh, I've seen chefs do like, um, like mousses in there for, for savory, like foie gras mousse and squab, and you can do purees of vegetables. You put you know, blanched leek tops and freeze it, and you have this really, really vivid sort of green paint. Um, and I think it's essentially a blender, uh, and you don't have to freeze the product. It has an aeration attachment where you can put cream in it and whipped cream. So it's really a, a really big multitasker uh, in the kitchen. Um, and it's fancy looking. Okay, um, so I'm gonna give you a little snack of foie gras. I hope that's okay. Um, so I, I'm gonna show you that this is the lobe you see has a phenomenal shine on it. And obviously if you're sitting in the restaurant and you, this comes to the table, you're gonna be, my God, what is that? Um, and I'm gonna send you a little piece of foie gras to eat. Everybody. All right, well, we, we can They're cut. Wait, wait, we'll, we'll send this. Right. You offer them foie gras, they, you know. I don't know, what can I do? What can I do? Um, so we're going to uh, take some questions, I believe. Exactly. Now. Do we have any I have, students I, in the background? I actually have some food shots I'd like to run, around? please. <laughs> Sally, wherever you are, please, food shots. <laughs> Thank you. This is some of the, uh, the food shots that we, some of the food that we did at Gil. I'm just going to have this looping just to get the appetite ready, and you can eat some foie gras and ask questions. It's, it's, Are you going to demonstrate anything else? Uh, no, no, I'm not. Uh, I, well, ready. then I'd, I'd like to ask you some questions. Go please. For it. Okay, so um, last night you did this, um, that really neat dish that, the, with the melon. And yes. uh, how did you do that? That's using aga again. That's melon puree and aga. But it was in the shape of, of the Exactly Savignon. the same idea. Um, Jordan is the gentleman. 
who produced that dish. So please ask Jordan a question if you'd like. Sure. Uh, essentially, um, you know, thinking about things differently in pastry and, and stuff, you know, every plate has to have an ice cream, every plate has to have a sorbet, and so, or a granita, and so we're trying to think of different ways to serve frozen components. Yep. And essentially we took, uh, last night it was a, a melon dish with caramelized eggplant and orange blossom. Um, and the Did melon, everybody hear that? It was, it was, it had eggplant. This was dessert, and it was so amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you liked it. I mean, um, the idea, the idea being that you don't have to have a free-form sorbet like a traditional Cornell. Exactly. The idea is taking the same idea, the same technique, as this. We're not reinventing sorbet here. All we're doing is just putting a little twist on it, making a sorbet into a spiral instead of a Cornell. I'm afraid we don't have a shot of it, but I can assure you it was delicious and it looked great. So. So can we, one more question, and I guess I won't, hog, I won't hog all the questions, because I'm sure there are lots here. You've asked lots of questions. We'll have some new people asking some questions. Uh, Johnny Ayuzi, <laughs> please, uh, right here. Johnny Ayuzi, <laughs> pastry chef of uh, Jean-Georges, please. Um, but um, you had, you had, the other dish that I really liked last night that you served um, had the, um, the mozzarella on the top yes. and, the ca and the caviar underneath. Yes. Yes. I thought that dish was really different. The texture was really unusual, and the flavor was. You want to describe that? Sure. How it, it was, was made? a. Um, we had puree of red carrot. Very simple, beautiful, fresh red carrots from the green market. Puree of red carrot. We have beluga caviar sitting in the carrot puree. We then have a, uh, a spuma foam, whatever you like to call it, using methacellulose made from parsnips and a homemade mozzarella. And we take the mozzarella and we take the curd and we make it with fresh buffalo milk. And we roll the mozzarella into very, very, very thin sheets and make squares out of it. And the, uh, the foam as it, you had it was a very big dome of foam. We relay over the, over the uh, mozzarella, over the foam. So you have almost like a ravioli looking. Yeah, it did look like a ravioli. Yeah, but when you bite into it, it's completely liquid. No texture. It just melts away. It's very interesting. Okay. Um, okay, so somebody here had a question. Yeah, you, somebody, right? please. Tell us who you are and... Sid from Chicago, I was curious to know how you cut that product while it's in the acetate. Uh, this is probably the best $2 you could ever spend at an art store. Uh, the X-Acto knife is uh, indispensable in, in, in uh, my pastry kitchen. Um, essentially, I mean, acetate is sort of clear thing and uh, it works really well because it um, produces a very, very fine sheen and when this uh, is in the freezer and it's rigid, you just run the X-Acto knife with the ruler and you cut it. Uh, there's also another technique um, where you can peel the top layer of acetate back exposing the sable and uh, a lot of pastry chefs use like a, a pastry wheel bicycle that's sort of like an accordion with uh, pizza cutters and you can just literally cut all of your uh, sizes in sort of two motions. Um, and it, it makes things uh, very, very, very efficient. You place it back in the freezer and let it get firm again, and then you just peel it back, and you have these wonderful you know, shapes that you've cut out. Um, this one in particular, uh, I did just with a ruler and an X-Acto, and it's, it's very, very simple. OK, another question? Paul, um, all of this cuisine, we're, you're, the title for your demo is Art or Artisan. Do you have an answer to the question? Um, not really. I'm still searching. Well, what's for the it. difference? Let's let's what's talk about the differences. I, mean, I guess you could say. I guess you could say. Look, the, the artists are artisan. Um, the art part is okay. Being an artisan, this is Malabar spinach. It's a beautiful spinach leaf. It, it's great. Why not just dress it and do a nice green salad of spinach with some foie gras, mm -hmm. more like a traditional style? Why take the trouble to? to dry these and make croquants out of them. And this is about 12 hours worth of work here to get this. But you get a different form, a different texture. Whereas that's the art of it. And it's going that extra way. And it's, again, not reinventing the wheel. It's just thinking about things slightly differently. Um, and that's worth it to you? For me, the way I cook, the way I, I enjoy food, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I love the cerebral element in food. I like to be challenged. Food should be something which should be fun, exciting, um, delicious. But at the same time, um, I think it should challenge you. It so, shouldn't be boring. So then the next question, of course, is how do you make that pay? How do you make that pay? Balance. I think, Balance I think is Paul's still working on that one. I'm still working on that one, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to go there. Yes, but. <laughs> 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 I think 
that was actually brought up in Daniel Blue's. Yes, you right. Know, but Danielle has Danielle has restaurants that allow him to pay for exactly. Um, so, I, would, so would you? Actually, we should have asked you, Danielle that question. We should have said which restaurants in your group make money, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he might not have answered. Um, um, but the question is, would you ever consider having a, a, a regular bistro so that it can allow you to do this? Absolutely, yes. To make it more approachable and affordable to uh, the general public, absolutely. Not everybody wants to sit down and have food like this, to sit down and go through an experience like this. Some people just don't want to do it, and that's fair enough. But we don't just do that. I mean, mm -hmm. it's based on good classical cooking. That's the heart, and it always is. So. Um, one of the, the, one of the things that keeps coming up with you is couture. Yes. You, Pierre May talks about having a new, uh, a new line of, of couture of, cuisine. Yes. Of couture cuisine every year. So yes. is, is this your 2006 collection? Um, yeah. I anybody from anybody yeah. from Vogue? Yeah, we here? have a we have a question about yeah. the leaves. Just the spinach leaves. How did you uh, crystallize them? These are crystallized using uh, a product called Lightes which is a, uh, a modified sugar um, which has no sweetness to it because we don't want it to taste like a dessert. Do you have that here? Uh, I did. Um, I used it all, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Lightes, L-I-T-E-S-S-E. -E. Um, it is a, uh, it's a modified sugar. Um, it has the sucrose protein in sugar. Has it, when you eat it, um, the way it's been engineered that your taste receptors are blocked to the sucrose so it doesn't taste sweet. It still has the same chemical properties of sugar. It caramelizes, it crystallizes. Um, and what we do is we take a solution of water and lightess, about a 30% solution, so say 300 grams of lightest, 700 grams of water. We would bring that up to a bowl to make a, a general syrup, if you will. It has no taste, no odor. We then soak the leaves overnight, 12 hours, in the light test solution. We then take them out, spread them on the silpat, and dry them extremely low, 185 for about two hours. It, it was a little rushed today, unfortunately, because I'm sort of in between kitchens right now. So we, uh, we dry them, and uh, you get this amazing, beautiful, like stained glass looking leaf. And as you can see, there's on the DVD, we, we yeah. do it with a lot of different products here and it retains the taste, the texture, the color of the product that you're doing. So really, it's a great technique. Um, done with a hibiscus last night, yeah? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so we're gonna show a close-up of this leaf and then we're gonna say goodbye. But um, Paul will be here, it's lunchtime now, so you can, um, you can ask Paul more questions at the back of the auditorium. And we, this is a really short lunch, right? Real, really short lunch. If you don't, you don't wanna miss, Pierre May will be here at two o'clock. Um, he's come all the way from Paris just to be here and. We all have lots to learn from Paul, from Pierre, Thank you. from Wiley. All this afternoon, we want to start on time. Thank you, gentlemen.